will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, Andrews Vespers. And let us exalt his name together, for the Lord is good, is he not? I said the Lord is good, is he not? And greatly to be praised. The word says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, and blessed are they that put their trust in him. So praise ye the Lord. Praise God in this sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. The Bible says praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let everything that inhales and exhales praise the Lord. If you love him tonight, just put your hands together and bless his holy name. We praise God tonight. We thank the Lord for the music ministry tonight that has set the spiritual table for all of the ministry uh, tonight has led us to the throne of grace. It's my pleasure to be here. Happy Sabbath to you. It's a blessing to be here at Andrews University once again and to be here at this Vespers program this evening in this wonderful month of February has been designated as Black History Month. I want to thank our illustrious president of this great university and all of his administration, Debbie Withers specifically for uh, inviting me. Thank you so much for you and all of the Black History uh, Month planning team uh, for allowing me to be here. It's a pleasure. Uh, how many of you know if it had not been for God's grace, you wouldn't be here tonight? Amen, amen. amen. And so we're happy about that and we praise God for that. Uh, over the next few hours uh, tonight and then of course tomorrow morning, I'll be with you sharing and I'm looking forward to what God is going to do. Uh, the importance of this month is that it's not just for the benefit of those who are in the African American community, but it really is a celebration of God's goodness to all of his people through the struggle that we as Americans, we as those who live in this country have come through. It is a, it is a recognition of the fact that God is able to turn things that the enemy meant for evil and can bring good out of it. And so we just thank God tonight for how far he's brought us along the way. I want to uh, go to God's word tonight and just share um, a spiritual message that will hopefully set the tone for the rest of the weekend. And uh, I want you, if you would, to just stand with me. I'm going to just act like I'm back in Atlanta. Um, at my church at Mount Olive, and this is something that we do. If you would stand with me at this time as we get ready to read the scripture, I'm going to go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verse 6, if you want to pull out your smartphones, your, your iPads, particularly your iPhones and iPads, because those are really the only phones and tablets you should have. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so if you have an Android, we'll be praying for you. But... Um, <laughs> I figure I'd just get your attention that way. Uh, whatever smartphone you've got, whatever tablet, or if you've got actually written pages on a book, if you actually still have the Bible in print, you can open that to Acts chapter 16. And I'm going to read verses 6 down through 10, and then I'm going to read verses 16 down through 27. Now, uh, if you are with me, just say yes. yes. Okay, Acts 16, verse 6. I'll read from the NIV tonight. And uh, we have you standing not only in honor of God's word, but you've been sitting for a while. Some of you have had a hard week. You might be prone or tempted to go to sleep. And so this serves a dual purpose, you standing. Acts 16, verse 6 says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Messiah and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Look at verse 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. 
She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She allowed Paul and the rest of us, uh, she, she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, not her, the spirit, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. But when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. So in verse 22, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them, watch this, in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. I want to preach tonight from the subject, break every chain. Break every chain. Let's pray. Now, Father, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I love God. What about you? I said, I love God. What about you? I love him, but I got to be honest tonight that sometimes I have a problem with him. I love him, I honor him, I reverence him, I respect him, but sometimes I don't like some of the things he does. Maybe I'm just the only one tonight who will be honest enough to say that I love him, but I don't always understand him. And sometimes I have a problem with God. Some of the problems I have, one of the problems I have with God is that he does not do what I want him to do. That the way that he moves in my life and the things that he does, I don't always agree with. Now, I agree with the blessings he gives. I receive that in the name of Jesus. I like that. I'm, I'm open to the blessings. But what I don't like is when he blocks me from things that I think I need, but in his infinite wisdom, he hides from me. Am I talking to anybody here tonight who sometimes wrestles between loving God and not liking his ways? Uh, because sometimes God will block you from a good thing. I'm, I'm in the text because I think Paul understands what I'm talking about. Paul has finished preaching in a certain area. He's done his work and he realizes that his season in this particular place of preaching is over. And he's got to go to another place. Paul is wise enough to know that some seasons, though they may be good and though they may be ordained by God for a season, that after the season is up, you've got to move over. Let me stop right here and let you know that you have to be sensitive to the Spirit to know when something is over because some of us stay in things that were meant for a specific time period and we overstay in the situation. You look like you don't know what I'm talking about, so let me come a little bit closer. Some of you are in relationships relationships that have an expiration date on it. Uh, let, let, me, let me explain. Uh, I, 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 I love to, you know, drink milk and uh, I went to the refrigerator one day, get some milk. And uh, I, I, did, I did look at this little date on the top. It, it said uh, 
there was a specific date on there. The date had gone by and passed three days ago, but I wanted some milk, so I took it and I drank it anyway. Now, I got sick, and my wife comes around. She says, why are you in the bathroom so long? Why are you so sick? I said, because I, I drank this milk. She said, did you check the expiration date? I said, yeah. She said, well, why did you do it? I said, well, I wanted it anyway. She said, don't you understand the reason why the expiration date is there is it's only good up until that date, and if you take it and ingest it after, what was good for you in the season it was made for is no longer good for you in this season. Come here, let me help you. There are some of you who are in some relationships, some situations that has an expiration date, and the reason why you ain't happy anymore is because that man, that woman, was for last year, not this year. Paul had enough sense to know when the expiration date on the ministry in that certain area was over. So now he makes up his mind. He says, I've got to go to the next place. So he starts looking on the map, and he realizes that in Asia Minor, the gospel has not been preached there yet. So he comes up with a plan. He says, I'm going to go to Asia Minor. The gospel of the resurrected Lord has not been preached there. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. He makes up in his mind. He looks at the map, and he says, Asia Minor is a a good place to go and do a good thing. He wants to go to Asia Minor and preach the gospel. That's a good thing. Yeah, that's a godly thing. That's an ordained thing. But we read in the text that Jesus, the spirit of Jesus, blocks him from doing a good thing. How do you wrestle with a God who blocks you from good things? Maybe it's because sometimes God will block you from a good thing so you can experience a God thing. Because some of us are so focused on good things that we ask and expect God to do things that are beneath his miraculous power. So there are some good things God will withhold from you because if you got it too early, you might give credit to yourself, your intellect, your financial prosperity, but God will hold it back because he will withhold good things so you can experience a God thing. They tried to go to Asia Minor. It was a good thing, but it was not a God thing because Asia Minor was not Paul's assignment. See, here's the problem I have with God. It's his will. The fact is, his will is not mine. Do I have any witnesses? The, the, the problem, if we're honest tonight, is that we struggle with the fact that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts that his ways are beyond our understanding. Paul was trying to go to Asia Minor and do a good thing. Why would God block him from doing a good thing? Because God wanted him to experience a God thing. So he tries to go to Asia Minor. God stops him. Uh, he tries to go to Bithynia. He says, well, if God doesn't want me in Asia Minor, I'll go to Bithynia. God blocks him there because hear me tonight, God not only orders your steps, he orders your stops. God stands in his way. Some of you ought to praise God right now for the things God blocked in your life. Because there's some situations you would have gotten into. There's some folks you would have hooked up with. There's some situations you would have put yourself in that you thought were good, but there is one who knows you better than you know yourself. And God blocks some good things so you can experience some God things. Paul says, well, what am I supposed to do? He goes to sleep one night, God gives him a vision. You just read it, and the vision is of a man in Macedonia who's beckoning him, saying, come to Macedonia, come and help us. He makes up in his mind that this must be God, and so they, they, they go to Macedonia. Macedonia is a region, and if you follow the rest of the story, you don't have time to go through all of it. By the time you get down a few verses, they are in Macedonia, but in a particular city. They're in Philippi. Now stay with me. Philippi is in Macedonia. Philippi is a city in the region of Macedonia. They were asking God, where should we go? What is your will? God says, I want you through the vision to go to Macedonia. They are in Philippi. Philippi is in Macedonia, which means they are in the will of God. 
They are in the will of God because they're in Philippi, which is in Macedonia, which God has shown them is his will. But just because you're in God's will does not mean everything will go the way you planned. They're in Philippi, and the Bible says they're going to the place of prayer one day. If you're still with me, say yes. They're in this place, and they're going to the place of prayer, and they see this girl. This girl is following them around. This little girl is following them around, and she's blowing their cover. Now, they're there preaching the gospel. They're not trying to make a whole lot of fuss. They're just trying to quietly go about their ministry, and she's following them, saying, these men are of God. These men are telling you the way of salvation, and, and they're disturbed by this. They're disturbed because, because this girl is blowing their cover. This girl is annoying them, and she's following following them around, and, and here's the first thing you got to know about the will of God, is that when you are living in the will of God, you will be aware of things that other people are not aware of. I, I'm in the text because she sees, she sees them, and she's talking about these are the preachers, these men are preaching the way of Jesus, and no one is realizing that this woman is actually, this girl is possessed of the enemy. So, so she seems to be complimenting them, but they, because they're in the will of God, are able to see past her empty compliments and see the spirit behind what they're saying. Come here, let me help you. You've got to understand that when you're in the will of God, God will open up your eyes to see some things people can't see. You'll be able to read past empty compliments and see the spirit behind the statement. You'll be able to see that everybody who says something nice to you is not trying to be nice. They're setting you up so they can stab you in the back. That when you're in the will of God, you'll be able to see with spiritual eyes things that are going on that, that, that folks are trying to work and intimidate and, and try to work you over. See, they were able to see what other people could not see when you're in the will of God. You're able to see that just because he took you out for a nice dinner at the most expensive restaurant in Berrien Springs. <laughs> I'm trying to remember if they have those here. But ju just, because, just because you took you does not necessarily mean that he is a gentleman. See, because... There is a spirit behind everything someone does. And when you're in the will of God, you're able to discover what that is. They were able to look at this girl, and they were able to understand that although she was telling the truth, it was not coming from a true place. When you're in the will, you're aware of things other people are not aware of. Oh, but it gets deeper because when you're in the will of God, you address things that other people are silent about. Stay with me. They realize, they read past her empty compliments, her PR campaign that they did not ask her for. They read past that and they realize that this is coming from a bad place because when you're in the will of God, you not only are aware of things other people aren't aware of, but you address things that they're afraid to talk about. Can we talk tonight? I say, can we talk tonight? See, when you're in the will of God, you are under the spiritual obligation of calling things as they are. Notice they did not stop the girl and tell her to stop following them. They addressed the spirit that was possessing her. And when you are in the will of God, you address issues, both spiritual and social, that nobody else wants to talk about. Please don't miss the fact that this girl is a slave. She is a slave. She is owned by somebody who's making profit off of her possession. And Paul and Silas are able to talk about what's really going on with this girl. They address the spirit that is making her act that way. Because some people aren't just mean. Some people aren't just hateful. Some people aren't just racist. Some people aren't just biased. It's sometimes a spirit. I knew it would get quiet right here. Because we are, we, when you're in the spirit of God, you begin to address things that other people don't want to address. They, they speak not to the girl. They speak 
to the issue that the girl has because sometimes we're obsessed with the obvious. But you've got to move past the obvious to the supernatural. This girl is possessed of the spirit and they begin to speak to the situation that's really, really going on. Because wherever you see oppression and subjugation, that is only the social, the social manifestation of a spiritual reality that's going on. This girl is possessed, and they are profiting from her possession. These Paul and Silas, they realize what's going on, and they say, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, not you, girl, because we're not talking to you. You're not the problem. It's the spirit in you. In the name of Jesus, come out of her, and the spirit immediately comes out. But what happens? The people get angry. Because, uh, here's what I've been trying to get all night. Because when you're in the will of God, not only are you aware of things other people aren't aware of, not only do you address issues that people won't address, but you will anger people who don't understand what God is doing in you. They set her free and the city got mad. I want you to stay, th stay here. They liberated her and folks got upset. Because there were people who had set up a system of profiting from her pain. Because there was a system in the city of profiting from her possession. Does that sound familiar? A system set up in a society that profits from other people's pain and possession. And in doing that, it is an evil and unjust system. And Paul realizes this, that you can be one of two people. You can be pathetic or you can be prophetic. See, the pathetic are those who placate to the crowd, who stand up and say things that you want to hear, that don't disturb your equilibrium. Those are the pathetic. But the prophetics are those who risk their own convenience and reputation in order to set the captives free. Which one are you? See, Paul says, Paul says, I'm going to set you free. And the people get mad because understand this, wherever there's possession, there is profit. Say with me tonight, wherever there's possession, there is profit. That is why, that is why crack cocaine, the cheapest form of cocaine, which, which, which was easy for black and brown folks in the hood in the 80s to be able to get because it was pumped into the community. That crack cocaine was different from the powder cocaine, which cost more money, where folks who were affluent, they snorted that. They didn't have the crack, but they had the powder. The legal system set up two different sentences. sentences. If you had crack cocaine, you got a longer punishment. If you had powder cocaine, you got a less punishment. Interestingly enough, disproportionately, black and brown men ended up in prison while others got lesser sentences. Why? Because possession always creates profit. That if a parolee has someone who's under state supervision, has a weapon, and they're staying in their mother's home, the mother might be innocent, but the cops can come in and seize everything in the home, and including the home, because possession always creates profit. What do you mean? Do you not know the U.S. penal system is a profit-making system? Prisons are big business. Because wherever there's possession, there is profit. And so the folks get angry because they can't make money off of her anymore. Now, now that's the social reality. Let me come a little bit closer to your and my spiritual reality. Because when we are possessed, not, not the foaming of the mouth, not the levitating off the ground, because the enemy has gotten us to believe that that is the only manifestation of possession. But you should know that possession can allow you to come to church every Sabbath, to get here on time, sing the hymns read the scripture and leave as devilish as you came our possession when the enemy has areas of our life that he is in control of 
also leads to profit. The reason why the people are angry is because they were used to her being possessed. Mm, stay with me. They were used to, they profited from her pain. And some people in your life profit from your pain, your addictions, your habits, your struggles. What do you mean, preacher, they profit? Well, there are some people who feel good about the fact that you are struggling in areas where they are not struggling. So they profit from your pain because they use you as a comparison. Stay with me, because if you got pregnant and had an abortion, but all they do is smoke weed every now and then, they could look down their nose of sanctimonious snobbery at you because they feel their sin is not as bad as your sin, so their conscience profits from your pain. And that's why some people don't always celebrate when you get free, when you get delivered. That's why some people are not happy when you get out of your addiction, when you stop going to the club on Saturday night after you sang in deliverance on Sabbath morning. Some folks aren't real happy when they see a change in your habits and a change in your tongue and in your language. They don't, they don't get happy. You know why? Because their scapegoat got loose. Because now they can use you as a way of comparison to make them feel better about themselves. So stop waiting for the applause of people. Stop waiting for them to throw you a party because you got better. You better throw a party for yourself and thank God that God's grace came in and changed your life. Folks will not celebrate you, but all of heaven applauds for the Bible says that all of heaven throws a party over one sinner that repents. She's set free. The people are angry. Now, remember, I started off by talking about the will of God. How do these two things go together? Well, understand they're in Philippi. They're in Macedonia, which is what the vision said they should go. They're in the center of God's will. But when they do God's will, the folks around them who don't understand God's will get angry. And they arrest them. And they beat them. This was unjust. This was evil. This was not warranted. They did not deserve this. And so they end up in a prison, not just a prison, but they end up in the inner cell, which is the jail under the jail. That's not only it. Once they're put in the jail under the jail, they have chains on their legs and on their arms, so they can't go anywhere. Now, here is the theological dilemma that we have. There's a gospel song that says, the safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of God. Really? I mean, it sounds good, but is it really true? The safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of God? Paul would tell you that in the will of God, you will be beaten. That in the will of God, that you will be falsely accused. That in the will of God, you'll end up in prison predicaments. In the will of God, he reads his religious and spiritual resume that he was run out of cities. He was stoned a few times and left for dead. That's what the will of God will get you sometimes. It is not always the safest place because God loves you so much. Hear me tonight. God loves you so much that he will risk your temporary safety in order to secure your eternal salvation. They end up in a prison predicament. They don't, they don't deserve to be there. All they were doing was doing the will of God. They didn't ask for this situation. Just like our ancestors did not ask to be brought over here on slave ships, minding their own business, serving the creator. They were not taught Sabbath and, the, and, and, and other theological understandings from those who came over. They were already serving God. They didn't ask for it. But sometimes the will of God is permissive. It's not God doing it. He just permits things. And that's the struggle that we have with God is that sometimes he permits things that we don't deserve. Am I talking to anybody here tonight in your own personal experience where you did exactly what God told you to do? Let me ask you, have you ever obeyed yourself into trouble? 
what, what you mean, preacher? I mean, have you ever done exactly what God told you to do and things did not get better? They actually got worse. Do I have a few witnesses? Uh, a few? Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, you did what was right. Uh, you're looking at me like you, like you don't understand. So you're vegan, okay? You're vegan. Praise God. You're vegan. And, and, and other people are struggling, but you're vegan. And you're the one who ends up with cancer. Okay, so you saved yourself. You're pure and you're chaste and you're not running around with every boy or your guy, you're not running around with every girl. You're chaste, you're single, you're pure, you come to church, you read your Bible, but all the folks who are giving it up got boyfriends and girlfriends and you still single. And the consequence of your obedience is you being alone. Hmm. How do you deal with that? How do you deal when you do everything? Paul did everything right. He went to Macedonia. He ended up in Philippi. He set the girl free in Jesus' name. And he ends up in a prison predicament. Here's the thing about the will of God. Here's the problem with the will of God. You. The problem is, is that God has got to get you to understand that he knows what's best for you better than you know what's best for you because the problem with God's will is that it's his will, not yours. They end up in a prison predicament. They did not deserve it. They did not ask for it. They obeyed themselves into the jail. Now they're not just in the jail. They're in the jail under the jail. That's not enough. How are they going to escape from the jail under the jail? But then they put chains on them. But the Bible says at midnight. Somebody say at midnight. At midnight. At midnight that's really the beginning of a brand new day at midnight. When everyone is supposed to be sleeping at midnight, when everything is quiet and serene at midnight, when the warren, the warren, uh, the warden of the, of the prison has gone to bed at midnight, Paul and Silas in a prison predicament have the nerve to start praising God. But, 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 but read what the text says. It says that they begin with prayer. They begin with prayer. Ah, they, they begin praying in a midnight prison predicament. They, they're not asking, oh God, why me? They're not reveling in the fact that they don't deserve this. They're in a prison predicament and they start praying. It is interesting to note that the Bible says they prayed and sang hymns. I believe they prayed first because there is this idea running around that praise is what liberates you. If you just praise God, you know, praise your way through, you'll be liberated. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says that it's prayer that sets you free. That, that it's the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous that avails much. And in their prison situation, they started calling on the name of God. They, they, they transformed their prison into a sanctuary. Because how many of you know you can call on the name of the Lord wherever you are, barefoot, in the cotton fields, the African slaves would be standing there and they'd sing and they'd call on the name of the Lord until they realized that even though they didn't have shoes, by faith, they started saying, I got shoes and you got shoes. All God's children got shoes. Now, they were barefoot, but when you start praying, it changes your perspective so that the prison no longer holds you. Even though you're physically there, you are free in your mind. Is there somebody here that understands that when you're in a prison predicament, all you've got to do is start praying? You know why? Because prayer purifies your perspective so that you see your prison differently. Mm -hmm. You didn't catch that. Prayer purifies your perspective so that you see your prison predicament differently, so that you realize you might be chained, you might be in a situation you don't deserve, but God is working things out for you. And I believe if you pray long enough, it'll lead you into praise. Now, here's the problem with our praise. Our praise is often reactionary. We praise God when things go well. But here's an illustration of those 
who praised God in a prison predicament. Why? Because prayer had purified their perspective so that now they're free in their minds even though they're still in the prison. So now they begin to praise because praise is proof that you believe what you prayed. Mm, you missed that. Let me help you. Praise is proof that you believe what you prayed. See, real prayer, real praise comes when you're still in the situation, but yet you say hallelujah anyhow because you know even though you're not free yet, God will free you in his due time. Do I have some witnesses here that have been in a prison situation and you begin to pray and then God changes your mind and then you begin to praise because you realize you might not be delivered yet, but your deliverance is coming. See, praise is a post prayer situation. You can't really praise until you've prayed. And that's why some folks who lead out in praise oftentimes don't have the spirit of praise because if you haven't prayed all week, then you don't have the right perspective to lead me to the throne of grace. Because I don't need a voice, I need anointing. Mm, you missed that, huh? See. I don't, I don't need to hear the gift, the vocal gift you have. I need you to sing out of your belly and out of your spirit and out of your experience. But the problem is, is that we have elevated praise above prayer and we've got it wrong. Prayer comes first, which purifies your perspective so that you can praise and know what you're praising about. Ah, I'm almost through, but the text says that they don't stop there. When they begin to praise, when they have finished praying and they begin to sing praises because they're free in their spirit, even though they're not free in their body, even though their physical manifestation is not there, as they begin to praise, something begins to happen. Something, I said something begins to happen. Now, when I used to preach this, uh, I used to preach that what happened was the text says in Psalms that, uh, that God inhabits the praises of his people. So when they began to praise, God came into the prison and the prison cell was real small and God could not be held by the prison. So the reason why there was an earthquake was because even though the prison could hold them, it couldn't hold their God. That's what I used to preach until I understood what was really going on. Because the Bible says, look back at the text, it does not say that their chains were broken. It says all their chains were broken. Now, now you, you, you missed that. You, you missed your shout cue. Right in the sermon, that was where I planned for you to say amen. So you missed your cue. I'm going to give you another opportunity. That, that It wasn't their chains, their chains that were broken. Remember, Paul and Silas were the only ones praying. Paul and Silas were the only ones singing. But the Bible says all their chains were broken. Mm. You got your cue. Now, watch this. Uh, all their chains were broken? How is it two people can pray? Two people can praise and everyone's chains get broken. You ask me how, I'll tell you why. How your mama prayed for you, how your daddy prayed for you, and you didn't pray for yourself, but they had enough sense to pray for you when you didn't have enough sense to pray for yourself. And when they prayed, your chains got broken. Now let me help you a little bit further because I believe that the chains of everyone being broken was an answer to their prayer. Mm, stay with me. Because if most of us were in a prison predicament, we would pray for God to set us free. Mm, you with me? Right, right. So we would pray God set me free. God get me out of this. God, I don't deserve this. But the reason I know they didn't pray for themselves is because all the chains were broken. Now, what do you mean, preacher? Remember, they asked, where should we go and preach? God says, go to Macedonia. They end up in Philippi, which is in Macedonia. They're in the prison. Now, they would have never gone to the prison unless they had set the girl free, yeah the city angry and get put into prison. Have you ever thought about the fact that maybe God set you up to get into a place that you never would be so you could set people free? 
Wait, wait, wait just a minute, huh? All their chains get broken. The warden wakes up because he realizes that there's a prison break situation going on. The Bible says he looks out and he's getting ready to kill himself. Mm, wait, wait just a minute. Now, they don't know, they did not know that this man had suicidal ideations. They didn't know that this man was on the verge. What would make him want to kill himself? It wasn't just the fact that the prisoners were, were free. It was the fact that he was already emotional emotionally and spiritually disturbed. He needed something Paul and Silas didn't know. But when Paul and Silas said, don't kill yourself, we are here. The man says, I want to know the God you serve. I want you to tell me about the Lord you serve. See, some of you are in trying to invite your friends to church and they're not coming. They are not coming. But you got to know the best ministry you can do is be in a prison situation and still praise God. That's the best attitude advertisement for your God. Now wait just a minute before I take my seat. Do you realize what happened? The jailer who was the captor was asking the captives how to get free. Mm. Mm. The captor is asking the captives, how do I get free? They preach a sermon in the prison that they never would have been in had it not been for setting the girl free and making the people angry. The man not only joins the church himself, but his whole family joins because all the chains, both physical and spiritual, had to be broken. But wait, there's more before I sit down. Do you understand what really happened? Remember, the vision was of a man saying, come here and help us. You thought it was a man in the church, but it was the Philippian jailer that they never would have met had they not got the people mad and been put into prison. What am I trying to say? Maybe God broke you in so he could break everyone else out. Maybe he put you in a situation so he could break everybody else out. Because there are people who are watching you. There are people who are looking at you. And you can give them a Bible study, but they're not feeling that. They want to see you go through hell and still praise God. And when they see you praise God in a prison situation, you will set the captives free. So let me tell you what happened to you. You were set up by God. He put you into a situation so that people who would never come to your church will look at your faith in a prison situation and give God the praise. Ah, the man not only frees them, but the man sits down the captives and makes them a meal because God will make your enemies your footstool. Uh, I'll leave on this, Nelson Mandela, the great Madiba who just passed. Nelson Mandela jailed just for trying to make black people free in South Africa. And, and Nelson Mandela spends 20-something years in prison. Well, before he went to prison, understand there was this white African, Afrikaans prosecutor who was actually calling for their death. But the judge said, no, I will sentence them, sentence them to life because I don't want to make martyrs of them, thus encouraging the liberation movement. So puts them in prison. Well, 20 some odd years later when Nelson Mandela gets out, and he's out and then he runs for president and he's elected. When he is getting ready for his inauguration, he says, where is the prosecutor who called for me to be killed? They said, well, he is uh, now a judge practicing in Joburg. He said, fetch him for me because the man who was going to kill me will be the man who will swear me in as the first black president of South Africa. Because how many of you know God will make your haters your elevators because God will turn what the enemy meant for evil and make it for your good. Somebody ought to praise God tonight that he used your chance to set somebody else free. Because the safest place is not the will of God, but it is the best place. Because it is not about your security, 
It is not about your safety. It's not even really about your personal happiness. It is about your salvation. And not just yours, but everyone around you. He broke you in to break someone out. Your head's about, your eyes are closed. Is there anybody here who's in a prison predicament? You're in a situation that you, you don't deserve. You're under hardship that you didn't volunteer for, you didn't ask for. And truth be told, you tried to do what was right and everything went wrong. And you're asking yourself, why me? May I suggest to you another question? Why not you? Why wouldn't God use your situation to help free somebody else? Because remember, the will of God is not about you. The will of God is about God having his way in you. And someone here tonight is struggling. I know you're here because I've been where you are and I suspect I'll be there again. When you're in the place where you don't understand God's will and you don't agree with his will. But here's the thing. He'll not only set you free, he's going to set people around you free with your testimony. If you're here tonight and you're in a prison predicament and you need God to purify your perspective, understand the prayer should not be God, get me out of this. The prayer should be, God, free me in this. And if you need that perspective, because it's not natural, it's not human, you need prayer to, to, to purify that perspective so you can wait on God's time of your deliverance. I just want you to stand and I want to pray for you, if that's you. As music plays softly, I want you to understand that even though you do not understand, we do not understand the will of God. Salvation is not just personal, it's communal. That your personal struggle, if you can hold on to God, will not only change you, it will change the people around you. One of the great contributions, talking about Black History Month, one of the great contributions of the struggle of African-American slaves in this country and coming out to liberation is that we were able to show the world faith under fire. That we worshiped barefoot. That we stole away by the riverside and, and called on his name. And, and, and no matter where you come from, what language you speak, all of us, all of us will go through an unjust prison predicament. I pray for you tonight. I pray that you will spend time purifying your perspective through prayer and then praise God in advance of your deliverance. Not when you get it, but before, because praise is proof that you believe what you prayed. We're going to pray a prayer of praise tonight in advance of your deliverance. We're going to pray a prayer of, of, of praise knowing that God is not only able to do it, but he wants to do it. He's just waiting for you to get free in your spirit so that he can trust you to be free in every area of your life. Let's pray, Father. We thank you. We thank you that the will of God takes us to places that we would not willingly go if we knew beforehand. We thank you, God, that in the center of your will, even when we struggle to do your will, that you put us into places that gives us an opportunity to deepen our faith. 
We will be honest tonight, we don't like it. We don't always agree with it. If it were up to us, we'd do it differently. But then again, you're better at being God than we are. So we submit to you. We'll cry in the prison. We'll get frustrated in the prison, but God help us most importantly to have faith there. And God, we would pray tonight, we would pray tonight that you not only set us free, would you set free all those in our sphere of influence, all those around us. Because just like in that midnight situation, Paul and Silas may not have understood there were other prisoners listening to them. Help us to know there are people watching us. They want to see if our faith will give way when things go wrong. They want to see if we're authentic, if our faith is legit. God, free people by freeing us. And Father, we thank you now in advance. We praise you in advance, not for the timing of the deliverance, because that's up to you, but for the reality of our deliverance. In fact, in Jesus, it's happening, and it is right now. Because they didn't praise you when they got out of the prison. They praised you in it. God will praise you right now in it. Break every chain. Break every chain. And free us for whom the Son sets free. He, she, is free indeed. In the name of Jesus, let every soul who's waiting on their deliverance say amen. Amen. God bless you.